So welcome to SETICOM. This is the uh, This is the first ever annual SETICON, as they say, and we're delighted to have you be pioneering it with us. Uh, my name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm going to be the moderator for this first panel, and before we get started, I have a couple of announcements and questions for the audience. Um, first of all, the announcement is that your program is an excellent guide to what's happening at the convention, except when it's not. Um, so there are a few things that have been changed and be flexible. Not, nothing major, but for example, some people's book signings are not exactly what it says in the uh, program. And so watch for announcements. The other thing that didn't quite get into the program is that we have an entire room way on the other side devoted to fun family activities. We're also going to have a number of interesting workshops, including one on how to build your own telescope, and you get a free telescope in the process. So uh, these workshops and the uh, inflatable planetarium require a free advance tickets. So they're free, but you need to get a ticket in advance, and tickets are available in Ballroom D. So when you uh, leave this session, if you're interested in the in climbing into an inflatable planetarium, if you're interested in some of the family workshops, just check out the tickets in the next room over Baldwin D and get one while they're still available. All right, uh, I also have some questions for you. First of all, I'd like to find out where you're all from. Uh, how many of you are from the Bay Area? Excellent. How many of you are from outside the Bay Area but in California? Good. How many of you are from outside California? Very good. And how many of you are from another world? <laughs> I see a number of my former students raising their hands. Good. Excellent. Um, so, uh, how many of you pre-registered for this convention? How many of you bought your tickets today? Good. Um, how many of you are members of Team SETI? How many of you are new to the SETI Institute? Just learned about it as part of this program. Very good. And how many of you have fewer than one, think about this, fewer than one college level astronomy course in your background? How many of you have fewer than one college level? That means zero. <laughs> how many of you have one astronomy course in your background? How many of you have more than one astronomy? Okay, we are not supposed to be here, but we'll let you know. <laughs> That's great. This is a public event uh, designed to share the excitement of the search for life elsewhere in the universe with the public, and we're delighted to see all of you. Uh, this panel is on the Fermi Paradox, which I'll explain in a second. I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, very briefly, you can read more about them in the program. Uh, Seth Shostak, as many of you know, is the voice of the SETI Institute. You've heard him on television, on radio, you've read him on space.com. He is uh, both a se senior scientist at the Institute and the person who speaks to the public most often on behalf of the work that we do at the Institute. His most recent book, which will be available for signing in the autograph area, is Confessions of an Alien Hunter. And I think you can get him to talk more about that book if you just ask him. <laughs> On my right, needing no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway, is Dr. Frank Drake, our godfather, um, the man. The man who began the science of SETI uh, roughly 50 years ago with the first project to search for extraterrestrial radio signals from possible alien civilizations. He is also the author of the Drake Equation, which uh, uh, many of you know from your studies of astronomy. Uh, he has been the president of the SETI Institute uh, and is now on the board of trustees. Uh, he has been perhaps the most active person 
converting the science of SETI from a realm of speculation to a realm of science. On my left is Andre Bormanis, a television writer and producer. Uh, he has been involved with such uh, television shows as Threshold, Legend of the Seeker, 11th Hour, and Star Trek Enterprise. He has written scripts for other Star Trek series. He's the author of several books on the intersections between science and science fiction. And he was a science consultant for Star Trek, so I think we owe him a great debt of thanks for some of the good science that has appeared on Star Trek over the years. Um, he is also a consultant for the Planetary Society and a, a wonderful explainer of scientific concepts and how they relate to the world at large. Andre Bormanis. And I'm Andrew Pracknoy. I teach astronomy at Foothill College, just up the road here in Los Altos. I'm the vice chair of the board of trustees of the SETI Institute. And from time to time, I get to tell bad jokes on local radio that some of you may have heard. Um, and my job is to get out of the way and let the panelists and you have a wonderful discussion. But let me introduce the notion of the Fermi paradox very briefly. Enrico Fermi was a great physicist who helped unlock the secrets of the atomic nucleus. And he was also a really big fan of asking simple questions and getting his students and colleagues to think deeply about them. Uh, he would ask questions like, uh, how many atoms from the last breath of Julius Caesar do you inhale when you take in a lung full of air? <laughs> and then the students were supposed to go and think about it. So in the early 1950s, when our story begins, was the start of the UFO craze in America. And there was a lot of press attention being paid to the so-called unidentified flying objects. And one summer day in 1950, Fermi and three colleagues at the Los Alamos National Laboratory were walking to lunch and talking about the UFO craze and the possibility of life elsewhere. They then began to have lunch, and in the middle of lunch, legend has it, all of a sudden, Fermi said, in his way of asking big questions, so, where is everybody? And by this, he didn't mean people at lunch, but everybody around him understood that this was continuing the previous discussion, and he meant, if life among the stars is common, why don't we have a lot of visitors from advanced civilizations that have developed space travel and are now tourists in our neighborhood? Uh, this idea of where are they, why aren't they here, has become known as the Fermi Paradox, although other scientists before and later had also come up with this thought. And not everyone is impressed by the weight of this argument. Physicist Lee Smolin once wrote, the argument for the non-existence of intelligent life out there is one of the most curious I've ever encountered. It seems a bit like a 10-year-old child deciding that sex is a myth because he has yet to encounter it. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to invite our panelists to make an opening statement about their take on the uh, Fermi Paradox. Then we'll have some exchange among the panelists, and then we'll open things up for discussion with you, the audience. And Frank, would you like to begin with a story? <clears throat> yes, I've, I've given a lot of thought to this. Is, is it up? I think so. Just talk closer. I'm myself. Uh, <clears throat> I've given a lot of thought to this, and uh, there is a book out that has something like 50 explanations of the Fermi Paradox, reasons why the extraterrestrials aren't here. Uh, I have my own, which I'll get to in a few minutes, but Andy told me I should only give you the uh, headline on it at this time. But... Uh, very simply, I believe the tourists aren't here from outer space for two reasons. One is it's too dangerous, and the other, which is much more understandable, is that the tickets are too expensive. <laughs> uh, you can elaborate a little bit. <laughs> okay. So the line is turned up, please. Yeah, maybe you should use the other mic as well. Let's see how works better. Is this one better? No. Uh, <laughs> if you get closer. Oh. 
it, it's, 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 it's hard to do it quickly. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> do I dare take a few minutes? Yes, a few minutes would be fine. I'll do my shtick right now. <laughs> uh, there's actually a, an overarching issue here, which is the effect of science fiction on our beliefs about life in outer space. Uh, most, most of what the general public and even the scientific world thinks about aliens, they've learned not from textbooks, but from movies and uh, television programs. And they've uh, seen Star Trek where you can dial up Scotty and say warp seven and the time it takes to do a commercial, you're at another star. And uh, the belief is widespread because of this, that uh, oh, a few hundred years from now, that'll be true, that'll be the way it works. And that going from one star to another is very easy, that the technology is reliable and simple, and there's a lot of it in action in space. And the fact is that that is not true. The uh, universe is a huge and awesome place. It is full of hazards. And what's needed here, and this leads to an understanding of the Fermi paradox, is a, a, a honest understanding of the challenges of interstellar space travel. And that's what I'm going to get to. First, hazards of interstellar space travel. Uh, people blithely talk about going at half the speed of light in spacecraft and things like that. Um, first, we have no propulsion systems that can make that possible, but there are ones on the drawing board that might, but they do involve very exotic technologies like controlled nuclear fusion on board spacecraft to provide enough energy for such high speeds. Uh, but what has been missed in this particular thing is that going faster than a fairly reasonable speed is so hazardous that uh, you would not do it with living creatures. Now, how does that come about? It's because uh, when you go fast, in particular a fraction of the speed of light, if you impact a very small thing, the amount of energy released is catastrophic. And uh, just let me give you a feel for that. Uh, it works out very simply that if you're going about 12% the speed of light and you collide with something, the energy released is mv squared over 2, high school physics, kinetic energy. mv squared over 2 at 12% the speed of light gives an energy release which is equal to that which is produced in the sun in the nuclear fusion process. In other words, a hydrogen bomb is created. And all it takes is a pebble, the size of a BB, striking you at 12% the speed of light, and you will be destroyed by a hydrogen bomb. Well, space is full of pebbles, pebbles that have been thrown out of asteroid impacts and planetary systems and the like. And so what this says is you can't go fast. It's too dangerous. Uh, well, how fast can you go? Well, let's, let's imagine a tenth the speed of light. That's already very risky. What's implied by that? Well, let's just imagine. And this is, now I'm going to give you my solution to the Fermi paradox. Why the ticket is too expensive. Tenth, one tenth the speed of light. Let's just imagine. All right, you're sending uh, some a group of people. It's enough to colonize another world, which is normally what's in, involved in the Fermi paradox. You're going to create a colony on some other planet. Uh, we're going to go to tenth the speed of light. The nearest habitable planets are probably 10 light years away. Uh, this trip's going to take 100 years. When we get back to that, that's probably not very inviting. But the main question, and this is just basic physics and what has been missing and is never present in any of the science fiction material, is how much energy is required to do this. Let's imagine your spacecraft weighs about the same as a very small airline, or 737 aircraft. Most of you have traveled on one of those. Uh, with a 737, you can take probably 50 people with a, some adequate supplies and means for recycling air and water and all that, which you would have to do on a 100-year mission. Uh, so 50, 50 humans, that would, might be enough for a viable colony, although it's pretty marginal. In a 737 aircraft, going to tenth the speed of light. Well, take the mass of a 737 and just to do the mv squared over 2 again. How much energy is that? Well, it turns out, I won't give you the number because it's one of those astronomical numbers that the astronomers pretend to understand. Uh, 
The number is amount of energy equal to 200 years the total electric power production in the United States at the present time. You would have to shut down America for 200 years to launch this mission. This mission which is very hazardous. And uh, it's worse than that. That, that is assuming that uh, the energy conversion is at 100% between the electrical power and the speed of the spacecraft. And no propulsion systems are that efficient, so it's going to be much more than 200 years worth. And worse than that, that only gets you there. It doesn't slow you down. You have no way of landing anywhere. And it doesn't get you back home either. Uh, so we're talking about prodigious amounts of energy here, and this is just basic physics, and there's no technology that can reduce the amount of required energy. Well, <clears throat> Think about it, would you like to take such a trip? Would you like to spend 100 years on a 737 eating airline food? <laughs> nowadays that means snack boxes, <laughs> pretzels, occasional glass of water, recycled water, it's not very tasty. You're watching the same movies over and over and over. And just think what the price of the ticket will be you have to pay for, uh, each passenger has to pay, pay for perhaps 10, 10 years worth of electrical power production in the United States. Uh, even Bill Gates would pale at this challenge to his pocketbook. So <clears throat> these are the reasons I think that we are not having tourists. Uh, why interstellar space travel with creatures is very unlikely. I mean, the only solution, the only workaround of what I've just described is to go slowly. Uh, and then people hypothesize that maybe there's a suspended animation and things like that. But uh, it's just not worth it. It's too costly. It's too hazardous. The chance that the mission will ever get there is very small because of the danger of collisions. And when you think about it, you do much better by learning about other civilization with radio waves. Okay, I'm going to let you have the second. Oh, all right, thank you. Thank, thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to this. And it's, uh, I think this is going to be a great event. Very much looking forward to the other talks. I would, uh, in, first of all, to uh, speak uh, somewhat in defense of Star Trek and other science fiction, I would say <laughs> that uh, you know, Star Trek was never about interstellar travel and contacting aliens and seeking out these uh, strange new worlds among the stars. Uh, Star Trek was about the 1960s and about what was going on in our world at that time. And on television in those days, you know, there was no cable. It was all the networks and a few independent stations and the FCC and, you know, other political organizations had a lot to say about what you could and couldn't do on television. Certain topics that Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, wanted to explore in a television series uh, we're just not we're just not allowed on TV. You couldn't talk about race relations. You couldn't talk about whether or not the, uh, the Vietnam War was a good idea. And uh, there were a lot of other topics that uh, you know, uh, sexual mores and so forth that you really just couldn't uh, couldn't address on TV at the time. Remember, Star Trek started in 1966. Rob and Laura Petrie were not allowed to be seen in the same bed. They had separate beds in their bedroom uh, back in those days. And uh, Gene realized, hey, you know, if, uh, if I do this crazy science fiction show, I set it in the future, I paint people green and put funny ears on them and stuff, I can get this past the network censors. I can do a show about, about uh, you know, the, the foolishness of, of, of racial bigotry. I can do a show about uh, the pointlessness of war. And uh, because it's coached, uh, couched in this uh, science fictional uh, garb, uh, people will just sort of ignore it, or at least, you know, the censors will, oh, it's science fiction, you know, that's just all fantasy, so, you know, who cares? And that's, in fact, you know, his, uh, sort of the, the, the genesis of that television series. But Gene also, he wanted to try to create a credible science fiction universe in the sense that he didn't want the show to be perceived as just another Captain Video or Flash Gordon. So he, he talked to engineers at JPL, he had them over to the house, he took them down to the basement where they had a pool table and they'd lay out their plans and talk about things like, oh, you know, Gene would ask them, well, what are you working on? What's like the most advanced form of propulsion that you can imagine? And they said, well, 
we got this thing called an ion drive. It's really cool. And they showed him, you know, how it would work. And, and then he asked him about, well, what's the most, you know, extraordinary source of energy you can, you can imagine today? And, well, antimatter is, you know, it's like 100% conversion of matter to energy. And, oh, great. And so Gene tried to build a, a, a starship that, while the technologies were fictional and in the far future had a certain grounding in technical reality, so that people would buy the illusion that he was uh, that he was trying to sell. Uh, there's a term that's used in um, screenwriting and <coughs> literature generally: the, the willing suspension of disbelief. You have to uh, you have to do enough to convince the audience to accept that the world you are showing them is real, even though it may contain these fantastical elements. And the way Gene went about doing that, which I think was very clever, is he designed uh, the Starship Enterprise like a, uh, uh, a Navy ship, a battleship. It had a bridge, it had a sick bay, it had an engine room, and so forth. And then he sprinkled in these uh, ideas about exotic technologies, warp drive and antimatter. He needed to get his characters into the action of, uh, you know, what's happening on planet, uh, planet X in a given episode very quickly. Well, he couldn't, he didn't have the uh, special effects budget to land this big spaceship on a new planet every week, so he said, oh, teleportation, we'll make this thing called the transporter. It's a great storytelling device. And, and that's ultimately what these things were, storytelling devices. And uh, certainly when I was a kid watching the original Star Trek, I was very much inspired by the show to explore real science and, you know, learn relatively quickly some of the things that Frank was talking about. And, and all of that is certainly is certainly valid. Uh, I don't think that it was ever Gene's intention to make it look like interstellar travel would be easy someday. On the other hand, uh, if you look at what else was happening in the 1960s in the real world, I had a piano teacher when I was a little boy, um, lived across the street from us, Ethel Daniels. She lived to be 104 years old. She was 21 years old when the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, and she lived to see men walk on the moon. That's kind of extraordinary. Uh, Charles Lindbergh, right, first guy to fly solo across the Atlantic, attended the launch of Apollo 11. He was only 66 years old. Uh, we saw an extraordinary surge in technology and, and advancement, especially space technology, over the course of those post-war years that no one could have anticipated. I mean, few people dared. Some did. Some science fiction writers thought that maybe this was all going to happen much sooner than people, uh, than uh, sort of sober-minded people might imagine. And, um, you know, that gave, uh, that gave other people a certain amount of optimism. And that proved to be unfounded in the sense that, you know, people figured by, you know, the end of the 1960s, hey, we'll be on Mars by 1981. You know, we'll be sending probes to uh, Jupiter and Saturn and their moons in the early 2000s. Well, that didn't happen for a lot of reasons, most of which had nothing to do with technology, most of which had to do with politics and money and so forth. Um, so I would say that, I tend to agree with Frank that certainly the way that interstellar travel is depicted on Star Trek will, will never happen. It's kind of like arguing that the, the flying machines that Da Vinci uh, envisioned, you know, 400 some odd years ago could ever be made real. On the other hand, I don't know that it's impossible to, to someday build a starship, to someday build something that would send living organisms, people, uh, across interstellar distances. I suspect that it would happen in ways that we cannot imagine today. Uh, as far as why, if that's the case, there are no tourists uh, from other planets visiting the Earth. Um, again, I think it is, as Frank says, going to be very difficult, very expensive, and there are probably just, even if you could do it, smarter ways of trying to make your presence known or find out what's going on in other parts of the galaxy. Robotic probes, for example. Um, people are talking today about how you can build with uh, exotic solar sails, these sort of microgram-sized spacecraft that could conceivably travel to nearby stars within a human lifetime. Um, and I imagine that 50 years from now, uh, there will be people thinking up and designing things that we can't even imagine today. Um, Stanislaw Lem, who's one of my favorite science fiction writers, talked about something called the window of contact in one of his novels, Fiasco which was about an ill-fated expedition to make uh, contact with a uh, planet that uh, was discovered to have intelligent life via the SETI program. And basically, Lem makes the point that, you know, it took about 50,000 years for human beings to get from first learning how to make fire to developing the oil lamp. But it only took about 200 years after that from the oil lamp to the laser. 
So there is a, what, what technologists sometimes call an S-curve. Sometimes when you develop a new technology, progress in that new technology happens very, very rapidly for a few years, a few decades, and then it kind of tapers off. We see that in space technology, certainly, from the, the V2 of World War II to the Saturn V, only about 25 years, extraordinary. But in the last 40 years, we've made virtually no progress in chemical rockets and propulsion. We don't have anything that can put as much mass into low Earth orbit as a Saturn V today. Um, so there's this sort of plateau that you reach until the new game-changing technology comes and replaces the old technology. And we're still waiting for that game-changing technology in space propulsion. Maybe it's nuclear thermal, maybe it's this Vasmir drive that uh, Franklin Chang Diaz is developing, maybe it's something else, but who knows? I mean, I can't preclude the possibility that such things may someday exist. Again, I'm not saying warp drive, but something that today we cannot imagine that could make things much more, much more uh, likely in terms of interstellar exploration. But this, this uh, sort of window of contact idea is also interesting in the sense that if there are these revolutions periodically, and if technology advances in an exponential fashion, um, maybe, maybe the, uh, maybe the, uh, uh, the, the species who are capable of uh, making physical contact with the Earth are just no longer interested. Or maybe they, uh, maybe they, maybe they can watch us from afar and learn everything that they need to know without, without bothering to make any kind of physical contact. Uh, there is also, of course, the Prime Directive, which says that <laughs> advanced species will not make contact with a primitive society such as ours. And therefore, we haven't seen space tourists because, you know, we're still under this kind of planetary quarantine, which, uh, I don't know, you know, again, I'm, I'm a skeptic when it comes to these things. I think they're not here because, as Frank says, capability, it's, it's, it's very, very hard. It's, even if you could do it, why would you do it? Lots of other ways you can explore the universe. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about this thing called the singularity, which is this notion of anything. It's called the nerd rapture in some circles. Which is, yeah. I think is kind of the idea that at some point our technologies will become so advanced that we just cannot see beyond the horizon of what is technologically uh, feasible. And so we will have uh, technologies beyond present day imagination, maybe 20, 30 years from now. That's but a lot of solutions. It's a lot of solutions. Yeah. I'm sorry, so I, I could babble on for hours, obviously, but uh, let's uh, save some of the rest of it for the QA and let's uh, hear from you. Right. I'm going to ask Seth to comment. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be relatively brief. Look, uh, how many of you knew about the Fermi paradox walking in here? Essentially all of you. All right. You, so, so you know, you know that the, the problem is to reconcile our natural optimism that they're out there with the fact that we don't see them. And the reconciliation falls into three categories. First off, the, the whole Fermi paradox may be apocryphal. It's not clear that Fermi actually said. Where is everybody? And apparently one of his uh, physicist friends who was from uh, Budapest said, they're here, they're called Hungarians. Uh, <laughs> the, the categories of solutions fall into three categories. One is the very simple explanation. The reason we don't see them is because they're not out here, out there. There just aren't any aliens. That's simple. Okay. The second corollary to that is they are here. Right? A lot of people, one third of you, think that they're here. Right? So then there's no problem with the Fermi paradox. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I won't go any further into those. Second is, are the sociological explanations. Andre has alluded to that, saying, oh, well, maybe they're no longer interested. Right? I mean, it's true. You've heard now 17 different ways about how difficult it is to go from one star system to another. And who's going to do it? They've got better things to do. Frank has made the argument in the past they could use the cost, the energy cost, to simply improve life in their own condo developments and not go into space. Right? All of that is true, but the problem is, and this is the strength of Fermi's argument, is that they don't have to all do it. Only one society has to do it, and the galaxy would be colonized. It's very akin to what happened right after Columbus discovers America. Within 30 years, there were Spaniards up and down the coast of the Americas. Right? Just went like that. So once you get it started, it's relatively quick compared to the age of the Americas. So, uh, so these sociological explanations, they're not interested, they don't find out, you know, don't look at even the Romans didn't conquer the world, the British didn't conquer, well, they did, sort of. I mean, they, these, these, are, these sociological explanations all stumble on the fact that you only need one exception, and now you're back where you started. The third category of explanations, of course, is what everybody's been talking about, technological. Now, Frank says going 10% to speed of light is not on. I'll, I'll 
I'll buy that, as Howard Hughes used to say. But what if you want a tenth the speed of light, or a tenth, a, a, a one tenth of one percent the speed of light? Right? That's a hundred times slower than what he's talking about, which means all the problems, including the energy that you use, go down by a factor of ten thousand. Even then, you colonize the whole galaxy in fifty million years. And 50 million years is very short compared to the age of the galaxy. It's like the Spanish colonization of the Americas. It doesn't take very long, so you still have this problem. Well, okay, I'll just offer a few ideas for these out there. One, I kind of like the urbanization hypothesis. Like the suggestion that actually the galaxy is urbanized, right? And so there are places where there are more aliens and there are places where there are fewer aliens. Right? It's sort of like I take you a blindfold, you spin you around six times, throw you in an aircraft, fly around the country for 12 hours, and then take you to some place 20 miles south of Winnem up in Nevada. Right? They open up, open up your eyes, you look around. I don't see any houses, I don't see any roads, I don't see you know, transmission towers. I don't know where I am. But wherever I am, this continent is not colonized. That might be your conclusion. That's making a very general conclusion from a very local observation. I looked at my backyard this morning, I didn't see any bears in my garden. There's been plenty of time for bears to walk to my garden in the history of bears. <laughs> but they're not there. I guess there are no bears on this continent. A very, very, very grand conclusion from a very local observation. Uh, so I like the urbanization one. Maybe we're just in places uh, not, not uh, terribly interesting. But let me just, I I'm going to try and keep this short here. Let me just suggest to you that maybe the real problem is a horizon problem, that we're very parochial in our thinking here. We're thinking in terms of rocket ships, of sending protoplasm to the stars. It's kind of nutty to send a protoplasm. I mean, you know, uh, to begin with, you can send the DNA, the, you know, the DNA in you fits on a CD. You know that, you know, all the, the base pairs in your DNA. The information that was in the sperm and the egg that made you fits on one CD. You can broadcast that, you know you can broadcast it, the, the radio stations do it all the time, in less than an hour, even on AM, right? FM. So you could send that information to the stars at the speed of light very quickly, if that's all you want. The trouble is it arrives without the college education, and it turns out that adds a few more bits to you. Most of my friends, not many, but there we go. So, so you would say, so why are we sending the protoplasm? Do they need to have pancreases in space? I mean, why send all of that when really what you want to send is the information? My suggestion to you is that what we're seeing here is we're on the cusp of a big uh, evolutionary step, right? It's taken four and a half billion years for Earth to get to the point where it has intelligent beings, but now in a matter of tens of, of years, hundreds of years, we're going from what may be biological uh, intelligence to something else. This is like the Cambrian explosion. Or maybe it's like trilobites sitting around and thinking, why are there no trilobites all over the place, right? It's really the wrong question because that's a very short stage in the evolutionary history of, in our case, sentience, okay? And in fact, this is not the Cambrian explosion, maybe this is the Cilicium explosion, right? That who is to say what our technology will allow us to do, say, a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million years from now? Will we still be these sort of corporeal beings that you know, hang around for 70 years and learn something just in time to be thrown into the ground? I mean, it, it, is that what we're going to be doing a million years from now? Or is it, in fact, merely a step on the way to something much bigger, much better, where we reduce the size of everything, we upload our consciousness into machines, which don't really have to go anywhere in the sense that we've been talking about here with big rockets, right? Or, and I use the last suggestion is one that you hear occasionally, and that is maybe all of reality, of course, is synthetic that we are simply a computer simulation being run by some history, uh, history major, you know, three centuries from now, none of this is real anyhow, in which case it doesn't matter. <laughs> and prove that by next Thursday. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, get the panel to respond, if you have responses to each other, and then we're going to open things up. I actually will start with a question for the panel, but Frank, do you want to say any more to what the other people said? Or? Well, I just had one comment, uh, which uh, Seth mentioned, and that is, you know, if you're, if you're a serious uh, civilization that's conserving resources, as we, uh, as all civilizations will have to do, uh, there is this question of how do you best use your resources? Do you use them to send a, a challenged, hazardous mission that, into space, which will return nothing to you for perhaps hundreds of years? Or do you say, use those same resources to enrich your own civilization in place? 
Uh, I mentioned the amount of uh, uh, energy required to send a, a colony to a nearby star. That same amount of energy is a million times more than is required to create a colony in our own solar system by terraforming asteroids and doing actions like that. For one millionth the cost of this wild interstellar mission, you could have a very comfortable space colony in, this, in the uh, <clears throat> spirit of Gerard O'Neill, for those of you who remember his adventures in designing space colonies. And so there's another argument there, that uh, if there really are governments still <laughs> in the future, uh, the Congresses of those governments are very unlikely to put resources into an interstellar mission when the same resources can greatly enrich millions of uh, inhabitants in your own solar system. But, but Frank, couldn't you have said the same thing in the 16th century? A lot cheaper to stay in Europe and build up a good life. And, and many people said that during the Apollo days. Why are we spending all of this money on a moon race when we could be spending it to enrich you know, people's lives here in the United States? So, so my question to begin with is, uh, several of you have mentioned the possibility that uh, alien civilizations may not look like protoplasm, but may in fact be micro-miniaturized, uh, some sort of computer or robot uh, entity. And are we sure that such entities do not at the present time exist in the solar system? The answer to that is no, we're not sure. It's very hard to find them. Uh, you, you, couldn't, you, you know all about the, the Voyager probes, and, right, the Pioneer probes. If they were entering our solar system rather than leaving it, I, I don't think we would have any inkling that that was happening. Okay, well, we'll open things up. Uh, what I'm encouraging people to do, if you would, those of you who came in late, is to come on up. Um, we have a large room, and, and we have room up front. And what I'm going to ask people to do, if you have a question, is to raise your hand. I'll recognize you, and then uh, please ask the question in a loud voice. Gentleman over there. Hi. Uh, Carl Sagan, in one of either, I think, Pale Blue Dot or Billions and Billions, gave his vision of the human future in space as going out into the solar system, then going out to the Kuiper Belt, then going out to the Oort Cloud, and then taking the relatively short jump to the Oort Cloud of the next star, and so on, and so on, and so on. If he can think of that before such technology is really viable, why have another alien species around the galaxy thought of that same thing to speak to Seth's 50 million year plan? That could be a billion year plan, but it would be sufficient in a, in a galaxy that's older than five billion years. I think it's important to state again, while it is difficult to go from star to star, at least in the ways we think of doing that, it doesn't violate physics. It doesn't violate physics. So to rule it out is making a statement about what you think technology is ever going to be able to do. So I agree. Uh, let me do a little follow-up on that. The, uh, uh, as you were just referring to, uh, Carl visualized uh, the colonization of the solar system. It turns out there is enough energy coming from the sun to support 10 to the 22nd power humans. 10 to the 22nd power, that's uh, 10, uh, what is that, 10,000 million, million, million humans. That's uh, 10 to the 17th, I guess, times more than we have now. Now, that's a lot of folks, you know. You really don't need to go to the stars. Uh, and you can do it at much less cost uh, here. So that's another argument why uh, colonizing your own solar system, if you really need to want to colonize space, is the preferable thing. Yeah, um, uh, uh, just a disclaimer, I'm, I've been like a, a scientist and for but here's the thing, I live in the state of California, and they can't even get around to building a high-speed rail in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you guys have been to Europe or Japan or something, and you see, even China, I think, they see an operation. I shouldn't say even China, I mean, they, they're like, oh, I have credit cards. But the issue is, if that's the case, then, then who would pay for these, for these dreams? Because when I was watching Star Trek as a, as a college student, so to speak, um, I would always wonder, who paid for it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, was it, and that was even before Proposition 13. Right? <laughs> so for those of you in the back, the question is, who would pay for interstellar travel? Or even, even in a planetary travel. Yeah. They, they definitely dodged those questions uh, in the original Star Trek. There was a, they sometimes made references to uh, 
money or credits and stuff like that. But then in the movie, uh, remember the movie Star Trek IV, where the crew has to come back to present-day San Francisco to find a couple of whales uh, to save the future? Uh, Kirk has a line, uh, you know, they're still using money in this era. We need to find some. He goes and hawks a pair of, of reading glasses that Dr. McCoy had given him to antiques. And uh, I thought, well, that's kind of funny, you know, this whole notion that, yes, if you looked at it from today's perspective of how things get done in our society, uh, yeah, who would pay for it? Well, you know, the United States in the 1960s, through the political process, agreed to pay $24 billion in, in 1960s dollars to send Apollo 11 and the subsequent flights to move. Uh, you mentioned China. China, uh, the, the, the people who govern that country basically just decide what they want to do with their money. There is no political process per se, or if it is, it's not connected to the, you know, the average citizens of that country. And I could imagine certainly that, you know, someday China, you know, or a government like it could decide, decide to do something very bold. But, you know, all of these assumptions are kind of grounded in the limitations of our present day reality. Seth mentioned one alternative, which is that, you know, biological evolution may be supplanted by some sort of biotechnical evolution, or, you know, we may figure out someday how to, you know, upload our consciousness to, you know, silicon. I'm, again, a skeptic on these things. But I think that what we know today is, is, is a very, very tiny, tiny little thing compared to what we could know or what we will know a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand years from now. So it's kind of like, you know, it's almost like a thousand years ago, if people had this debate about traveling to other planets, they'd be kind of in the same position that we are with talking about interstellar travel. The, you know, you might have some inkling of, you know, the Chinese have these new things called rockets. I wonder if you could build one that was powerful enough to, you know, they had no conception of, you know, the Earth's gravitational field and all these other issues that come into play. Maybe we're in that same position today. I don't know. I just think that it's very hard to, you know, Jules Verne used to say what one person can imagine another can create. Maybe that's too optimistic, but I just, you know, yeah, what we know today is, is clearly not enough to make interstellar travel practical. That doesn't mean that it will always be impractical. Other comments from the panel? I have to say in defense of Hungarians, since, uh, <laughs> since Seth brought this up, that it was a Hungarian, John von Neumann, who suggested one way out of this, which would be that you build eventually, not tomorrow, self-replicating robots, that is, machine beings that include the ability to make copies of themselves, but actually to go somewhere else is the ultimate extension of this, and mine the resources of that other place, use the energy from the starlight of that other place to make copies of themselves. And that way the replicating and the travel that would be involved is all built into the process of going to another world and doesn't cross the original civilization anymore. This could be a very dangerous thing if you don't like the machines that are doing it, <laughs> but that is one way that you could have not so expensive space travel and replication. Yeah, in order to forestall aggressive uh, comments from the audience on this, uh, obviously this, this has been thought of, and this is the Fermi paradox extended to machines. Uh, Frank Tipler down in uh, Louisiana has made this point uh, very, very cogently, actually. And so then the question becomes, why haven't the machines devoured everything yeah. in sight? Okay. And uh, who's to say, you know, space is pretty empty. Maybe they, they have. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, su suggest to you, a comment that was made to me on a discussion about this once by Chris Chiba, who used to be at the SETI Institute, and he said, well, in a sense, we've got those machines right here on Earth. They're called bugs. They're called insects. Now, you go outside, take a look at any plant that's out there. And look at the leaves, you know, on a tree or something, and you'll see there's all these holes in it where the bugs have chewed away part of the leaf, right? So here you have these self-replicating plant-eating machines called bugs, but they have not driven this process to completion. They don't strip every tree of every leaf. It never runs to completion. The reasons here are a little different than they would be in space. But that's maybe a, an instructive lesson, that these things don't go to completion. That the, the Roman Empire, is, as you know, dominant as it was, was restricted basically to the Mediterranean. Okay, the, the bugs are restricted to you know 10% of the leaves. Right? So so maybe indeed that's something to keep in mind if you're worried about machines conquering the galaxy. All right, question over there. Um, so if you want to colonize the galaxy, doesn't it make sen more sense to use directed panspermia to do it? 
In other words, um, you might send the machines, but the machines are actually the microorganisms. You just send bacteria everywhere in the universe, or maybe just the DNA and let it infect all the worlds in the galaxy that are ha habitable. Well, that's maybe how life came to Earth. It grows on Earth. Maybe we are the aliens. <laughs> Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut wrote a short story, a satirical and somewhat cynical story, that, whose title I cannot mention because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it involves a dirty word. Do you know this story? The Great Space, fill in your own four-letter word, about, about uh, sending a rocket that had freeze-dried uh, <laughs> human essence, let's say, <laughs> to another world. And it was, uh, you know, it was, I guess, a way of kind of just... Uh, he was commenting on how we uh, were spending a lot of money doing things that uh, didn't make much sense to him and despoiling our planet in the process. But, um, you know, that, that sort of directive panspermia, yes, that's, that's another, another mode by which, you know, somebody, some other planet in some distant era could have conceivably uh, made life uh, spread to other worlds. And as Seth pointed out, you know, it only takes one. You know, in the 13 some odd billion year history of our universe, you know, or just in the 10 billion year history of our Milky Way. Only one civilization had to get it right to colonize the whole place. And the fact that they didn't suggest, as Frank says, either it's very, very hard, or, and they haven't tried, or they're not out there. I mean, maybe we're among the first. You know, maybe, you know, the universe is young compared to how long we expect it to live. We may be one of the first to achieve consciousness and intelligence. And maybe that's why it's, it's kind of a lonely place. Are we sure that we would actually recognize aliens if they were already here? We, we can't even talk to chimpanzees, and they're very similar to us. Uh, that we're finding organisms on the planet Earth all of the time, the archaeobacteria and so on, that we never knew were there. Uh, if the aliens were on our planet, how would we even, how are we sure we would even know that they were here? The question is, how would we recognize the aliens even if they were here? So you point out that, uh, you know, we can't talk to the chimps, but we do recognize that they're here. Uh, this idea of a shadow biosphere is very popular these days. Paul Davies mentions it in his book. Maybe Frank wants to say something about that. Uh, I think that's a long shot. Right? Part of the problem is that there's no good definition for life. If you've got one, you know, come see me afterward. Uh, you know, you've got a real money maker there. No, nobody knows exactly what life is. But on the other hand, as Justice Potter said about pornography, you know, you'll recognize it when you see it. Uh, it's, it's. Uh, it is conceivable that there's some sort of life here that we don't recognize, but if, if so, it's going to be microscopic, right? I mean, so those don't sound like galactic colonists to me, except in a sort of inadvertent sense. They may have hitched rides on rocks. By the way, in that regard, while it's completely possible to infect one world from another within your solar system, i.e., or e.g., from Mars to, to Earth, uh, it doesn't seem to work over interstellar distances simply because a, a trip in a rock of that magnitude normally will kill anything that we know about. That, that may be too conservative a statement, but that's the general conclusion. But in any case, that's not the kind of colonization we're talking about. OK. Another question? Uh, let's see, over there. Yeah. One of the ideas that's been um, put out there is the idea of millennium ships, which would overcome you know, some of the other things that, that were, were mentioned, where if you've got a large ship that can support a large population that's sent out, you don't necessarily have to travel at, you know, any significant fraction of the speed of light. You have time working on your side that you're going to have, you know, many generations that will live and die on this ship that will never see, you know, a planetary system, new planetary system or whatever that they're traveling to. But, you know, if you have a large enough expanse of time that, you know, they're eventually going to make it, you know, to a destination that, um, you know, I, I'm just curious because I, I don't necessarily hear that mentioned a lot in relation to kind of the whole idea of the Fermi paradox. So the question of a multi-generational spaceship in which generations live and die on a slow trip. That, that's been investigated. I think if you're going to do that, I mean, nothing wrong with it. This is the arc idea, right? There's nothing wrong with that, but I think you do need some sort of suspended animation. There have been some interesting studies, a couple of, I guess they were 
sociologists or psychologists in Austria who years ago did a study of this, and they decided that if you actually put all of you, say, the ship outside about to go to, you know, Praxemba Centauri and meet the Navi, and it's going to take, you know, a thousand years to get there, but that's okay, we're going to, we have a lot of men and women here, and, you know, there'll be another generation. If we keep you conscious all that time, which probably is better in terms of reproduction, although not necessary, I suppose. <laughs> The, the, the problem, and the conclusion that they came to was that uh, you'd, you'd all be dead in two generations because the, the, the whole contingent breaks up into cliques and there are power plays and this, that, and the other. And, you know, this is seen aboard ships that uh, you, you quickly kill one another. That was their conclusion. Uh, you just reminded me of uh, <clears throat> where the experiment's been done. And everybody killed each other. <laughs> The, the, the mutineer, mutineers of the bounty uh, colonized Pitcairn Island. If you go to Pitcairn Island, you find almost none of them are there anymore because there were, after a few generations, feuds, murders, uh, suicides. The only ones that are there are ones who were forcibly made to leave the island and live in New Zealand for a while and then were sent back to Pitcairn. And so the experiments were done, and indeed, it doesn't <laughs> have a very good success rate. <laughs> Question over here. Yeah, um, Seth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you one which is unanswerable, but you talk about all this happening in the blink of an instant if it happens at all. The problem there is you're thinking about it as if it were the first time then. If it can really happen in 50 million years, and it takes a couple of billion years to get to the point where you can do this kind of thing, we don't know when it would have happened if it ever happened. But it seems to me, if you're going to assume it could happen, it's unlikely we're at the point when it happens for the first time. The trouble then is you have to look at not the first time this happens, but what's the 10th or the 15th or the 20th time this happens, and what does that look like? Sociologically, technologically, everything, and we don't have a clue. So I think it becomes an even more difficult and unanswerable question. Yes, yeah, so can you summarize the yeah, question? Yeah, time makes the point that, given the age of the galaxy, uh, this would have happened many times, because it doesn't take very long. Right. And so the question we should be addressing is what's the stop, you know, the 15th colonization effort? Do, do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, you said it was an unanswerable question, but it won't stop me. I, <laughs> and, and, and I think it is in a way. But, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, I, I don't know that it ameliorates the problem. And I might, su might suggest that it may be that this is one of those deals that if you are the first, it's a winner take all situation. Right? I mean, uh, think, think of technology. If you're the first thinking computer, you might be able to forestall all the competition from then on out, simply because they can never catch up with you. They can never catch up with you. I, I don't know if that would apply to galactic colonization. Maybe, you know, they're, they're dueling empires. I mean, certainly there are the local cineplex, but I mean, <laughs> there, there might be dueling empires. But I, I think that that assumes that they're very close to one another in the degree of technological sophistication. And that strikes me, given the timescales involved, is very unlikely. That's like the, the Mos Eisley bar, right, in, in Star Wars, right, where they, uh, they, the cantina scene where all these aliens are sitting around having a beer together and playing music. This assumes that they all evolved more or less at the same time, otherwise it would be like hippos sitting around with you playing records. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe the, you could make an argument that winner takes all. Well, but there's all, the, the, other, the other point I would make, and again, this is very sort of, uh, geocentric, that at least in the history of this planet with human beings, civilizations rise and they fall. And there has never been a, I mean, we, we have yet to see something that, you know, lasts indefinitely, no guarantee that our civilization will. And it could be that, yeah, maybe five million years ago the galaxy was colonized and this great civilization arose and then it, and then it decayed and died away. And maybe that's happened several times over the course of the history of the Milky Way. And we just, you know, the, the evidence of their existence on, you know, even this planet is just probably long gone. So, you know, that's another possibility that, yes, you could create a model that says that if you, you know, if you uh, start out with a starship that can go, you know, 1% the speed of light, you get to this star, and then they create a colony blah, blah, 50 million years, well, it implies that they just kind of keep going. It doesn't account for the natural things that, as Frank mentioned, with Pitcairn Island, uh, you know, yeah, things break down too, you know. There would be fits and starts, and even if they did rise to colonize the galaxy, well, in all likelihood, they would eventually fall, so. I'll mention, because we're coming slowly to the end of this panel, that this discussion uh, is taken up not only in the scientific literature, 
but wonderfully in science fiction. Uh, not, just, not just Star Trek, but many, many novels and short stories now, particularly with uh, science fiction writers who have degrees in astronomy, uh, very much take up with the Drake equation, with the Fermi paradox, and begin to work these things out in a wonderful fictional way. And, uh, I keep a website on some of these really good science fiction stories, but uh, I'll mention one young author who I'm very impressed with, who's a British astrophysicist with a PhD in astronomy, Alastair Reynolds. And if you haven't read some of the novels and stories of Alastair Reynolds, he is constantly grappling with the with the Fermi paradox in very much the ways that you mentioned, uh, looking at where the civilizations rise and fall, how the time scales of the universe fit in with time scales of life, and there's some fascinating speculations there. So you can often go to science fiction stories to see this worked out further. And there's my lovely assistant holding up an Alistair Reynolds book. Look at that. That, that fine, just hold it up. Um, which one is it? The prefect. The prefect. Okay. He's written. So now, Seth's book. <laughs> I, th I think there's a question here. All right. So I'll take a couple more questions. We started a little bit late, so I'm going to let the discussion go on for a couple of minutes over time, but then I do need to let you get to the next session. So the gentleman over there. Yes. You, sir, in the black t-shirt. So um, I was thinking that at least a piece of the puzzle of the Fermi paradox is the notion of the galactic life zone, which is that if you get too close to the center of the galaxy, um, it's hard for stars to be in a stable environment for the billions of years that it seems to be necessary for intelligent life to arise and a civilization to arise. If you get too far away from the center of the galaxy, there's not enough metals for terrestrial planets to form, and so life is probably not very common there. And then there's the idea that perhaps if you're really an interstellar civilization, actually the center of the galaxy is more attractive. You know, that, that's where there's black holes and neutrons, I mean, there's energy, and it's, so, you know, just in the same way that we don't, at the center of our race and the civilization is not where we evolved, it's not the same place. We moved to other areas that, as we invented agriculture and industry became more attractive to us than when we first evolved, maybe that's an answer to the Fermi paradox. Right, so the question is about galactic habitable zones, does someone want to take that? I'm not terribly worried about it. If you look at the volume of, of near the galactic center that's really too tough for any kind of life, you know, it's maybe 1% of the volume of the galaxy. It's less than that, I think. The, the idea that uh, the outer regions of the galaxy don't have enough heavy elements, metals, as astronomers call them, anything heavier than helium is a metal. Uh, and, and consequently, there would be planetary formations over. That hasn't really been established, actually. They found planets in globular clusters, right? They have very few metals. So I, I, you know, I tend to be sanguine about this. I, I don't think very much of the galaxy is ruled out that, with that kind of argument. I, I agree with Seth on that. The uh, danger in the cent central parts of the galaxy is very minimal and limited to a very small area because, indeed, there are many more stars and the density is higher in the center of the galaxy, but still, space is very empty there. And then, as Seth just mentioned, in the outer parts of the galaxy, there are metals, there are planets, found planets around stars. And in my mind, the thing to always keep in mind when you talk about life in space is that life is very adaptable and opportunistic. It is very good at adapting to strange conditions, unusual conditions, and it will prosper. It will find a way. And so uh, things like the tilt of the axis of planets and such, I think, should not be considered obstacles to evolution of intelligent species has been, has been proposed, things like that, because life finds a way. So I'm hearing from the panel that real estate values in the galaxy are up. This is, this is not a bad investment. All right, well, I'm very sorry to report that this is the end of our session. I'd like to thank the panel for their contributions. <laughs> fascinating start to the convention and we want to urge you to continue thinking about these things and all the panelists will be in other sessions so you have a chance to continue this dialogue with them as the next two days go on. Have a great convention.